Our speaker today, Professor Massimo Pagliucci, Pagliucci pardon me, has a doctorate in genetics from the University of Ferrara, Italy, a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Connecticut, and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. His postdoctoral research was in evolutionary ecology. Currently, he is chair of the philosophy department at Lehman College and professor of philosophy at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. His research interests now include the philosophy of biology, in particular, the structure and foundations of evolutionary theory, the relationship between science and philosophy, and between science and religion, as well as nature of pseudoscience. Professor Pilucci is the editor-in-chief of the open source journal Philosophy and Theory in Biology, and is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In the area of public outreach, Professor Pilucci has published in various national magazines, such as Skeptic, Skeptical Inquirer, and others. He has a great blog called Rationally Speaking, and a podcast by the same name that he co-hosts that I highly recommend and listen to regularly. And then in his spare time, Professor Pugliucci publishes very prolifically, uh, last count, 113 technical papers in science and philosophy, and 12 technical and public books, which he has either authored or edited, and some titles are Denying Evolution, Making Sense of Evolution, and most recently, Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk. His forthcoming book, entitled The Intelligent Person's Guide to the Meaning of Life, forms the basis of his talk today. Welcome. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks for coming out. Um, as you can see, I tackle small topics uh, and, um, and things with easy answers. Uh, you actually got to be my guinea pigs because this is really an early preview of the book. The book is still not even in production. It's, it's finished, but it, it's going to start production in February. It's going to come out probably in the early fall of next year. Uh, but I figure, what the heck, uh, let's try to put together uh, some kind of um, presentation and see how it goes so that you guys will be giving me feedback um, about this. So this is very experimental. Of course, that thing after psi there, it's a, it's a letter Greek phi, which is the symbol for philosophy. So it should be pronounced sci-fi, but if you actually write down philosophy as P-H-I, then you have to pronounce it sci-fi, which really doesn't sound very good. <laughs> um, we heard a beautiful song a minute ago. Um, here's the song that inspired uh, this entire endeavor. Uh, that's from Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, uh, which starts, uh, why are we here? What's life all about? Is God really real or is there some doubt? Uh, yeah. Uh, what's the point of all these hoax? Is this chicken and egg time? Are we just yolks? Um, you can read the rest or find it online. It's, it's a beautiful song. Um, and I'm not kidding. The idea for the book came out because I gave a uh, sort of um, half-joking presentation many years ago at the Rationalists of East Tennessee in Knoxville, which was my, the group where I, that, I, that I belonged to when I was there. Uh, and then one of my postdocs in, in my lab came to the doc and said, you know, you should really write a book about this thing. I said, what, about Monty Python? No, about the meaning of life. So there it is. Um, now, what do you mean by meaning? Uh, the word meaning, of course, has different meanings. Um, one of which, the one that concerns us, is the implied or explicit significance of something or the importance, uh, the worthwhile quality, the purpose of something, right? So that's what we're talking about. Now, the ancient Greeks had a, uh, I think, better word for, for what we're talking about today, and that was eudaimonia, uh, which usually translates as happiness, but not really in the way in which the English language usually refers to, to language. It's more sort of well-being or flourishing. It literally means having a good demon, as opposed to a bad demon. Um, that if you have a bad demon, you're not happy. If you have a good demon, you're happy. So the word eudaimonia is really actually what, what summarizes what the book is about. It's, it's about how do we um, think and act um, in order to pursue a better, uh, a more flourishing life, a, a better life from the point of view of, of eudaimonia. How do we get this good demon stuff? Well, um, that hinges on the answers that we give to a certain number of fundamental questions, and the book is organized um, uh, on, the, on the basis of, the, of these questions. These are the questions. How do I tell right from wrong morality? What does it mean to love and have friendship? Uh, who am I? Not literally, but you know, in the more broader, broader sense. How do I know um, things? How do I know what is 
correct or not correct? How do I make statements about the world? What do I think about God and why? And what is justice? Now, obviously, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of these things today. You will get a preview of the two that are highlighted there. Uh, and in fact, even those, I'll have to be pretty brief because we don't really have a lot of time. Um, so if you want to know the answer to the, the, other, the other question, or at least that my take on the other questions, then you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> but you have to wait, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So the first question, which is at the basis of the book, the introduction of the book, is, well, and, and so who do we turn to for answers to these kind of questions or, or for a way to think about these kinds of questions? And the obvious candidates are religion, mysticism, science, and philosophy. There really isn't that much else out there. Um, by mysticism, I mean things like, for instance, New Age or Eastern thought. They're not the same, but the, that kind of thing. Religion, you're familiar with. Science, presumably, you're familiar with. Philosophy, you'll hear quite a bit about it in the next few minutes. Now, the first two we're going to take out um, with no argument. I'm not going to try to convince you that it's a bad idea to use uh, religion and mysticism as a guide to your life. If you want to have an argument, we can have it in the Q&A. It is in the book, of course. Now, the rest of it, if you add mathematics, I know mathematics, and logic, uh, they form something that until fairly recently used to be called sentia. Sentia is a Latin word for knowledge. Many, in, uh, many European languages, including, for instance, German uh, and French, do have a, a broader word that indicates knowledge in the broad sense, as opposed to just science, uh, which in the English language means something much more specific. So what we're looking at throughout the book is to use sentia, to use the com a combination of logic, science, and philosophy, occasionally mathematics, um, to tell us something about the world as it is, and to help us make up our mind about how the world should be. Okay? Those are the two questions. How are things in reality, and how do we want things to be based on that reality? Okay? That's the basic idea. So the sci-fi is, is what I call this sentia. Okay, so let's get into the thicket of it. So the first question that I'm going to start talking about for a few minutes is, how do I tell right from wrong? There's a lot of approaches. Uh, there are three or four four chapters in the book about this. Um, the first one, I'll, I'll start out with this quote by Isaac Asimov, um, never let your sense of morals get in the way of doing what's right, um, which deals with the idea that we have an intuitive sense of morality, which in fact I, um, I do talk about in the book. Where, that, where does that come from? Now, the typical way these days to introduce moral questions in philosophy is by so-called trolley dilemmas. Uh, the trolley dilemmas are becoming so popular that there is an entire subdiscipline of, of neurobiology and philosophy, ethical philosophy, called trolleology. Um, <laughs> and you'll see why in a minute. So these are thought experiments, right? You don't actually do them in, in, in reality. <laughs> They're much less dangerous and less costly than if you were to do it in reality. Um, and these, so these are hypothetical situations that are not meant to... Um, to, to really put you in, the, in front of a situation that could possibly really happen. They're meant to explore your intuitions about how would you react to certain things. And once you, your intuitions are up in the open, uh, they're meant to prompt the question, well, why did you make that? Why would you make that decision as opposed to that other decision? Right? So they're, they're tools to help us think through why we have these kinds of intuitions of, about what's right that Asimov is talking about. So the classical situation, there's many variations on this game, uh, but there's classically two situations. One is, uh, there you are, the, you're the guy with the question mark on his head. You can see that there's a lever next to him. There's a trolley going down the, the, the tracks, and you see that the trolley is out of control, and it's about to go on, the, on your left. <laughs> it's about to hit the five people over there, okay? And, um, and you can't stop it. You can't uh, warn them. There's the, 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 the brake is not working, no, nothing. But what you can do is to pull the lever and switch the track so that the trolley is going to kill only one person. You know nothing about the five people or the one person. You know nothing. You know, and that's not a matter of, you know, this is Hitler and that one is Mother, Mother Teresa. You don't know anything about them. They're not your friends and not your children. They're not nothing. Would you pull the switch? Now, 80% of people say they would. More or less, and this is actually a cross culture you can you can run this this experiment with different versions if the, if you don 't like the trolley, you can think of something else um, but eighty percent of people say yes, okay, then philosophers who are kind of 
they have a twisted mind. Um, they come up with a different variation. Say, so, okay, well, now imagine the same exact situation. This time you do not have a lever. You have a very large person you can push uh, for, off a bridge so that he will stop the, the trolley. And yes, it will stop the trolley. There is no question about it. You know, there's no uncertainty and all that. Would you do it? Now, 20% of people answer yes. Okay. Now, that's, however, a little puzzling because, after all, you're still, in both cases, you're, killing five, you're saving five people and killing one. Right? So what is it that makes people react intuitively in a, such a very, very different way uh, to, to the two situations? And um, the answer to that question comes from an interesting collaboration between neuroscientists and philosophers who have started doing these kinds of experiments and looking into the human brain and see what the human brain is doing when, they're thinking, when it's thinking about these, these sort of situations. So those are areas that you see on the diagram of the brain there. Um, the dorsolateral, the orbitofrontal, the ventromedial, and the amygdala. Uh, those are the areas that neurobiologists have discovered are involved in thinking about moral dilemmas. And what happens uh, is that if you're asked the first version of the dilemma, the one with the lever, it's your uh, dorsoventral and other part of the, the um, uh, frontal lobes of the brain that is responding, that's, that, is act, that it's working. That's the part of the brain that is involved in rational thinking. So you're making a rational, cold decision about pulling or not pulling the lever. But if somebody asks you about, would you push the, the, the guy off the bridge, now those parts kind of shut down or diminish their, their, their intensity of, of working, and the amygdala pops up. The amygdala is where your emotions work. So apparently the difference between the two responses is that in the second case, people get emotional about it. They stop using their rational brain, and they start doing the emotional thinking. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's the way it is. Now, of course, you have to, the idea is that, that once you know how your brain works, the next question you want to ask is, well, should it work that way? So should I be making that kind of decision? Should I be thinking with my amygdala, or should I be thinking with my dorsolateral um, brain? But before we got there, it, part of the book is about understanding where these things come from in order to demystify them. A lot of people think of morality in this kind of you know, strange way that either comes from God, there's an entire chapter in the book that shows why it cannot possibly be that way, and, and, or uh, they think of it as completely relative and you know, anything goes, we just make it up kind of stuff. It's more complicated than that. Not only neurobiology shows that there are certain specific areas of the brain that are interestingly engaged with moral decision making, but, new, but evolutionary biology gives us also some hints about where a sense of morality comes from. Why do we have this strong feeling that things are right and wrong? Um, and one of the things that people have done is to study primates, you know, our cousins, our close relatives. One of the best books that I can uh, suggest about this is Primates and Philosophers. Uh, which is actually a discussion between Franz de Waal, who is a primatologist, and a number of philosophers who comment on, on, his, on his research. Well, what biologists have discovered is that there are f about five building blocks of morality that are present in other species. Two of them are very common. One of them is kin it's called kin selection. This is a situation where a parent um, helps, engages in helping behavior with its offspring. Okay, it's, it's a natural thing for, most mam for all mammals to do and for a lot of other species. The classic example here is female squirrels uh, who give out alarm calls uh, if there is a predator coming in order to save their progeny. Now, in giving out an alarm call, they put themselves in the risk. Okay? But they do that because, of course, they want to save their children, their, their, their offspring. Now, interestingly, the males, son of bitches, don't do that. <laughs> because they are much less invested in their offspring than the females are. Um, the second building block uh, that you'll recognize, uh, it's, it's called reciprocal altruism, the great, the, the, the bat, one of the best examples in vi vampire bats, which are exactly what they sound like. They are bats that suck blood. Uh, they don't suck human blood, they suck um, uh, from, from cattle. Uh, typically. Uh, now, vampire bats have a very, very strong, very, very fast metabolism. They, they really need to consume a lot of calories uh, all the time. So they need to feed every night. So they swarm out of their, of their caves in, you know, thousands of individuals, and they go out foraging. Most of the times, uh, at least some of them come back with no food. They can't find food. They would starve to death before the next night. So what happens is that their friends share 
their, their blood, their food. They're, they regurgitate some blood. Even with individuals that are not related to them. So this is actual altruism. Okay? This is not just helping your kins. This is helping somebody who is a complete stranger. Why do they do that? Because the expectation is that it's going to be reciprocal. Okay? Tonight I feed you, but tomorrow I might be the one starving, so you're going to feed me. And the system works very well. It's a system called reciprocity, as the mu mu musical Chicago says. Um, it works. There is a song in there about reciprocity. It's set in jail, however. Um, and then things get more interesting and more complicated when we get to b building blocks of morality that are more typical of human beings. For instance, moral, the, the existence of moral sentiments, empathy, fairness, reciprocity. Uh, those are present, very, they're widespread, of course, both in humans, although I, I know some exceptions, and, um, and in other primates. They're found in, in, in a large number of other primates. Every social primate shares that kind of thing. Um, then we have mechanisms that deal with social pressure. Cooperation, punishment, reward, reputation. Those are essential for a social morality. Okay? The, the idea of, having, of saving your reputation or maintaining your reputation is one of the most powerful incentives to actually do thing, things for other people because other people recognize that you're doing the right thing as opposed to being a um, jerk. Uh, those exist in other primates but are particularly, uh, but they're less systematic than in human beings. In human beings, they're much more organized. And then finally, we have judgment and reason. This is the ability to internalize other people's needs and goals, to reflect on moral judgment, to use logic, and that sort of thing. And that's, as far as we know, uh, essentially exclusively to humans, and that we don't have a, a large literature by chimps on philosophy. The idea is that once you start putting all these things together, you get a demystified version of morality. You understand that morality is a natural phenomenon. There's nothing mystical about it. There's nothing strange about it. it in fact, the building blocks of it are found throughout the animal world, certainly throughout social uh, mammals, and particularly throughout um, uh, primates. Right, but once you know that, uh, the idea is that that's not enough. Uh, the kind of things you find in other primates are simply not sufficient for as, as um, uh, building blocks for morality when it comes to complex modern human societies. You have to have that last entry in the table, which is the ability to reflect on things and to think about things. That's where the philosophy comes in. Remember, the book is about the interaction between science and philosophy. So the science tells you where the basic stuff comes from. It tells you how it works and why it works. And then the philosophy comes in and says, okay, now that we have the basics, what do we do beyond that? Because clearly we live in societies that are much more complex, much more sophisticated, and they face moral issues that are, much, that are not found in, in, uh, um, uh, under natural conditions, either in human beings or in other primates. So there's a huge literature, of course, in philosophy about morality. Uh, what I do in one of the chapters in the book is I present the three major ways in which philosophers have thought about morality, and then I ask the reader to basically pick and choose different aspects of it and come up with their own morality menu, what I call it. What I do in one of the chapters in the book is I present the three major ways in which philosophers have thought about morality, and then I ask the reader to basically pick and choose different aspects of it and come up with their own morality menu, what I call it. The three major ways in which philosophers talk about morality, of course, are utilitarianism, which goes back to uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, this is the idea that uh, what counts in, in, in ethics is to increase as much as possible people's happiness and decrease as much as possible people's pain. Okay. Um, there's a huge literature on utilitarianism. I'm not, not going to touch it and, uh, at this point. There are some interesting aspects of it and there are some interesting problems, but I'll show you the comparison between utilitarianism and the other two in a minute, going back to where we started, the, the trolley dilemma. Uh, the ontology, which is duty-based ethics, uh, typically is associated with Immanuel Kant, although it's, um, it's also very popular uh, these days among, among philosophers. This is the idea that uh, a deontologist bases, bases his or her ethics on a set of duties that that person has that, uh, toward others and a set of rights. Okay? So when, whenever we talk about, for instance, human rights, we're talking about deontology. We're talking about duties and rights. The two go, go together. Utilitarians don't deal very well with rights. Um, they don't have a way to account for the idea of rights. And then finally, there is something called virtue ethics, which goes actually all the way back to Aristotle. And virtue ethics is about character. It really doesn't ask the question of what is 
is this thing right or wrong? Is this decision or this action right or wrong? It asks a different question. It, the question there is, what kind of life should I live? Uh, what kind of person should I be? And then the idea is that the answer to questions of right and wrong follows from the kind of person that you want to be. Now, if you think back to the, to the dilemma uh, posed by the trolleys, these three people would respond differently to, uh, to that dilemma. The Italian would say that you both have to pull the lever and throw the guy off the bridge. Because after all, the calculus in both cases is five people, five lives saved, one life sacrificed. It doesn't matter for the Italian how you do that. The fact, the matter, the fact that you are, you're resistant to doing it in the second case is just because you get emotional about things. Uh, but really, from a rational uh, utilitarian perspective, you really should push the guy. Uh, the deontologist answer is no to both. Because in both cases, you're using somebody else as a means to an end. You are exploiting the life of another person. Or even though the, the, the end is good, because you say, well, I'm saving five lives. Yes, but you're disregarding, you're treating the human being, that human being as an object. You're, you're not respecting the right to life that that human being has. So the deontologist would probably say no. Now you can say that, you can see that the difference between these two is that the utilitarian tend to be fairly permissive. A lot of things can happen under utilitarian ethics. The deontologists tend to be very conservative. A lot of things do not happen under uh, deontology. It's not by chance, by the way, that all religious morality is deontological. Right? So the classical example of deontology is the Ten Commandments. Those are rules, right? And you apply the rules without question. And that's the idea. The virtual ethicist's response is, it depends. Okay? It depends on what? Well, it depends on the fact that, you know, under some circumstances, that it may be worth to actually sacrifice somebody's life even, you, you, even without asking him. Uh, but on the other hand, it depends on how this is done. If pushing the, the guy off the bridge, for instance, uh, um, destroys your integrity as a human being, you cannot look at yourself in the mirror anymore, and therefore you're likely going to have very bad consequences for the rest of your life because you're going to make bad decisions from that point on because you really can't live with that sort of thing, then you shouldn't do it. So the virtual ethicist decision, again, it, it goes back to character instead of, of making a specific decision on a specific circumstance. It's a matter of, well, what would a good person do under those conditions? And there is no, the idea of the virtual ethicist is that there is no universal answer to that question, that the answer really does depend. It's not arbitrary. The idea is not that you can do whatever the heck you want. The idea, you still have to have reasons, but those reasons can be more nuanced and can be more context-dependent. Perhaps no surprise to you, but I like virtual ethics better. Now, my second example is about justice, uh, which, of course, is related to morality. Presumably, the, the idea is that we want to live in a just society. In other words, we want to have morality, the, the point, the, 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 uh, conce our concepts about morality applied to the level of, of society, not just to the level of individuals. Um, well, the problem, the question is, you know, what, what do you mean by justice? Um, and uh, the, the, the best answer the philosophers have been able to give is actually uh, summarized very well by an American Supreme Court justice, um, uh, Potter Stewart, who said that fairness is what justice really is. So this concept of justice as fairness is one of the dominant concepts in modern philosophy. Of course, that immediately brings the question of what does it mean to be fair? I'll get to that in a second. Now, let me start, however, with a classic philosophical problem about, about justice. And that, you can find this in Plato's Republic, one of the best early, uh, dialogues in the, in the, uh, by Plato, one of the best books probably of the Western canon period, um, where Plato discusses a lot of things. Actually, Socrates discusses a lot of things. Um, and um, one of the problems that is discussed there is the so-called problem of Gyges rank. Gyges, this is, a, this is a story, this is a, a friend of Socrates who's, who poses to, uh, a problem to Socrates. He said, look, I heard of this guy, Gyges, who um, was a, a shepherd and, and he was you know, going around in the mountains and he found inside a cave, he found a ring. And if he, he discovered that by turning this ring while I was, he was wearing it, he could turn himself, himself invisible. Okay. Um, if that sounds familiar, kind of, <laughs> Plato got there before Tolkien. Um, way before talking, 2,000 plus years, in fact, before. 
Now, the, the, the story goes that Gigi, what does he do? You know, he realizes this thing, he goes straight down to town, uh, he uses the, the, the invisibility ring to kill the king, seduce the queen, and make himself king of the, of the, of the city. Right. Now, the question that Glaucon, uh, the, the, the character in the, in the dialogue, poses to Socrates is, why shouldn't we do that? What, what's wrong with what Gigi is doing? Okay. If he has the power, why not? And the implication is, Everybody would do it if they had, in fact, if they could get away with it. Okay, and that is a good—that's a good question, which took about two thousand years to answer, or actually a little more. The answer comes actually in part from science as well as from philosophy. Uh, the answer is be well because human beings are naturally somewhat rational and somewhat fair. We're not paragons of either rationality or fairness, but we actually are naturally that way. There's some really interesting research in um, cognitive science about the relationship between cooperation and punishment and how they evolve, uh, evolved during human, um, human uh, cultural history. And particularly, for instance, what you find is you, you can do experiments where you set up two institutions to, to, um, uh, and, and you ask people whether they want to belong to one institution or the other. And those are represented by the, by the, the two uh, competing teams that are riding there. In one institution, people can do whatever the hell they want. There are no rules. Uh, if they want to contribute to a, to a uh, common uh, resource and then share it, that's good. If they don't, they, they, they have that option. They can just take from the common resource and not do anything, um, not contribute anything. In the other one, on the other hand, the second team has rules. You can, if you want to, to use the resources of the group, you have to contribute, and if you don't contribute, you're punished. Okay? So there is a system of regu regulations and punishments and rewards kind of thing. Now, guess what happens? Naturally, most people gravitate toward the first team. Okay? It's called the tragedy of the commons. It's called that situation, the natural situation, the natural response of human beings is free lunch. <laughs> but then, of course, they start realizing that free lunch doesn't last forever. You know, that resource is going to be depleted. They look over and they see that the other team is doing a hell of a lot better job, uh, including each member of the other team is doing much better because they're actually cooperating. And so they switch. So these experiments show that contrary to what you hear a lot these days in political discourse, human beings are naturally cooperative. They, they have, we, have an, we do have an instinct to get away with it if we can. But as soon as you put in place in, enough constraints, particularly... Uh, punishment and, and, uh, and uh, regulations in place, people immediately fall through and they say, okay, th this is the way to work. And they actually prefer that. So the, the punishment and regulations don't work because they are coercive. They work because people actually do agree that that is a better idea. It's a better way to do it. So there goes science and its relevance to the political discourse. Now, fine. But all of that is about, this, by the way, works also in other animals, in social animals. You can do that. You can, you can do computer simulations that show that the same thing applies even for hypothetical entities. But the, the idea, however, is that, of course, genetically based um, uh, behaviors like this, a social primate type behavior, it's not going to get us very far in modern societies because, modern, again, modern societies are much more complicated. The idea that I'm trying to put through is that, on the one hand, science does help quite a bit explaining why we have certain basic behaviors and why we react in one way or another. On the other hand, that science is not enough to tell us how to behave under much more complex cultural conditions that we created in the last few decades, centuries, or, or millennia. Uh, those things are simply conditions that have appeared far too fast and far too late for biological evolution to catch up with it. Okay? It will take literally hundreds of thousands of years for evolution to get, catch up with that sort of thing. So that's where the philosophy comes in. The ability to reflect on things and say, well, okay, so given that we know enough about, given what we know about human nature and, and human beings as social animals, what else can we bring in uh, in addition to what the biology does? So the biology provides the very basics and then the idea is that the philosophy builds on top of that. On top of that. Well, here I have to introduce uh, John Rawls. Now, there are several ways of de uh, the, in which modern modal philosophers deal with the idea of justice and, and, and um, related issues. Uh, the one that I find most convincing, and I, I, I do discuss some of the others in the book, but the one that I find most convincing is the one that was proposed by John Rawls in his uh, book, A Theory of Justice. Uh, this one came out, came out first in the 1970s, and then there was a um, uh, highly revised edition that he did in the 1990s, uh, you know, taking into account criticism that he got in the first time around. 
Rawls is arguably the most influential model philosopher of the 20th century. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm starting here with the big guns. Um, Rawls' ideas are based on three fundamental tools, which I'm going to go and explain uh, quickly in the next few minutes, and then we're going to be done. Um, because I think those are actually very interesting. They give you very interesting, very useful thought, uh, uh, food for thought. The first one is the idea of reflective equilibrium, which is a general method of thinking about things. It's just a general method of doing philosophical thinking. So everybody can learn to do philosoph philosophy by engaging in reflective equilibrium. I'll show you in a minute how to do that. So this is at least one thing you learned today, how to be a philosopher. Hey. Um, the second one is the idea of the veil of ignorance, um, which, uh, which Rawls is an idea that Rawls uses to ask the question of what kind of society would people agree to build if they were thinking rationally about building a society. And I'll explain in a minute what that means, how that works. And then Rawls proposes that part of the idea, part of, of the, the um, goal of, of bringing about a fair society is the implementation of two principles of justice, two fundamental principles of justice uh, that he arrived at. And I'll give you those as well. And then we'll finish with a song. Okay, so reflective equilibrium. This is the, a, a general method of thinking philosophically. Actually, it's a general method of thinking, period. Um, but philosophers use it a lot. Now, I'm going to give you first an example that has nothing to do with fairness, justice, and morality, uh, just to see, to see how this is going to work. Now, suppose that you just saw a flying saucer, okay? Or you think you saw a flying saucer. But you also hold a variety of other beliefs that are contradictory with what just happened. For instance, you think that there are no extraterrestrials visiting Earth. Uh, you are pretty sure that you don't hallucinate because you, were, you, you didn't do drugs um, recently. And, um, and you're also sure that you don't make mistakes about nocturnal objects. That is, you don't, you don't mistake the moon or Venus for a flying saucer because you're, just better, you're better than that. You know enough about astronomy. Well, all those things form a web of beliefs, okay? some of which are contradictory. They're not, this is not a coherent web of beliefs because some of the, 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 those beliefs are, in fact, contradictory. It cannot be that you both saw a flying saucer and, you, and you're sure that there are no extraterrestrials visiting on Earth, for instance. Okay. So the idea of reflective equilibrium is that you put out all this stuff and you say, okay, which one of those beliefs is the weakest link in the web? Which one can I modify? Which one can I get rid of and adjust the other ones so that I get to a more coherent view of reality or a more coherent view of what the problem is, right? So in this case, you might say, well, it turns out I didn't see a flying saucer. Or you might say, actually, I guess I have to admit that there are extraterrestrials visiting Earth and so on and so forth, right? So the idea of reflective equilibrium is that you try to come up with the most coherent view, the most coherent set of beliefs about the world um, that you can live with given the evidence. Seems like a reasonable thing to do. Right? And the method, it allows you to basically write down for uh, explicitly what your beliefs are and, and go from there. Now, how does that apply to morality? Well, let's say that you think that God is moral. But I also, also think that, you've, that, you, that your understanding is that the Bible is the word of God, that cursing one's parents is not a capital offense, and that the Bible says that children who curse should be killed. Well, now you've got another problem, right? Some of these beliefs are incoherent. They just don't hold up. All right. Now, you have several options. You can bite the bullet and say, okay, God is moral. The Bible is the word of God. Therefore, killing people, killing children because they curse is, in fact, moral. Not even a lot of fundamentalists would go that way. Okay. What they would do instead would just want to take one of the other options. Well, maybe God is not moral. Okay, a few people would take that one. Maybe the Bible is not the exact word of God. Maybe it needs to be interpreted. Maybe, maybe that's not what he meant, and so on and so forth. The point here is that by doing this kind of exercise, either by helping others doing this kind of exercise or by doing it yourself, you, are, you become more aware of the weak links in your reasoning. And once you put it there in the, in the out, once you actually present this you know, map to somebody, and the guy has to actually explain to you why he actually holds all four of those beliefs, Something interesting is going to happen. Okay. The idea is that this kind of method uh, triggers cognitive dissonance in the individual. And cognitive dissonance is bad. People don't want to have cognitive dissonance. They want to feel like they make, the world makes sense to them. 
if you point out to them that, look, this is what you are saying. I'm not, I'm not telling you anything. You are holding on these beliefs. Clearly, these are not compatible. What are you going to do about it? Um, it's more likely that they will do something about it. And certainly the idea is that you might want to do something about it that way. So that's what uh, Rawls uses at the beginning of his book to say, okay, here's how we, what we're going to do here. We're going to, you know, morality and fairness and justice are complex issues. They depend on a bunch of different things. They depend on a bunch of different beliefs. Let's lay them out and see if we can come up with the most coherent set of, of inter, interdependent beliefs about uh, fairness. So the second concept that I said um, uh, Rawls is, is using is the veil of ignorance. So the idea is, um, so let's suppose that we're having, we're having a constitutional convention right here. And we say, okay, we're going to build a new nation or we're going to rebuild the United States from scratch. And what kind of structures do we want in place? What kind of constitution do we want? What kind of you know, uh, safeguards, uh, rules and regulations and all that sort of stuff we have? And people would have all sorts of different ideas. If you're a you know, libertarian, Republican, a, a Democrat, whatever it is, uh, if you're religious, not religious, it's, it's on its way. If you're a member of a minority and, or not, if you're a woman or a man, you will have different ideas. What Rawl is asking you to do is to do this, the following thought experiment. He says, assume that you actually find yourself behind a veil of ignorance where you do not know any of the following. You don't know your race or ethnicity. You don't know your social economic class. You do not know your gender. You don't know your age. You don't know your natural endowments, whether you're cute, strong, um, smart, and so on and so forth. You don't know your wealth and income, and you don't know your religion. Okay? You know nothing about all those things as far as you are concerned. What you do know is the following. That people have different doctrines, that people have different religion, different political ideologies, and so on and so forth. You don't know which one you are going to be, but you do know that other people do have, once the veil is taken out, uh, they will have different opinions, different ideologies. You, you know that people want certain things, like health, shelter, food, and a, and a bunch of others. You know that society cannot provide everything for everyone. This is not going to be a society of billionaires. Right? It's called moderate scarcity in, in moral philosophy. And finally, you know some general scientific, psychological, and economic facts about the, how the world works. You know that you cannot create energy from nothing, for instance. You know that evolution happens, and so on and so forth. Given that, the question is, what kind of society would you want to build? Now, in order to appreciate what, is, what Rawl is doing here, imagine this, right? So the idea is that if you belong to, say, you're a Christian... You don't know whether the society in which you're going to end up being has a majority Christian or a majority Muslim or a majority something else. So you will want, presumably, a society where no religion has a built-in advantage because you don't know which bet you're going to be, if, if your bet is going to be a winning one. Similarly for, say, gender differences. You don't know whether you're going to be a male or a female, a man or a woman. So you want, presumably, the idea is that if you're a rational being, you want a society where there is equality between the genders because you don't know if you're going to get the bad, the, the, the bad end of the stick, okay? and so on and so forth for all the other ones. That's how the veil of ignorance works. Well, it turns out that the kind of society you end up with, with it looks a lot like <laughs> northern European social, social libertarian <laughs> societies. Um, not exactly. I mean, Rawls is actually even more, um, uh, Rawls society is even more ideal or more, more social libertarians than, than the actual uh, Scandinavian societies. But the, 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 you end up pretty, pretty much in that, in that area. And the funny thing is that international surveys about happiness, when people are, uh, are asked across the world what sort of things they prefer and what sort of things they like and they would like to see implement in their societies, the answer is also the same. So actually, science does back up the idea that that's what people really want if they think in the abstract. As soon as they get back into an actual political situation with, within their own nation, then all bets are, are off. But ideally, when, people, when you ask people, well, what kind of society would you like to live, and you don't mention where that society is, they give you a list of things that pretty much looks like Sweden. But we're more light. Uh, and finally, the two principles of justice. So Rawls, at the end of the book, says, look, the way to achieve all of this, the way to achieve this fair and, and a society that rational people behind the veil of ignorance would agree to, 
is by implementing two fundamental principles. Uh, the first principle is the idea that each person has the same claim to equal basic liberties compatible with the same liberties for all. That's pretty straightforward, right? The second claim is that social and economic inequalities are permissible, but only under two conditions. One, if they're open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity, and two, if they provide the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of society. Not only that, but according to Rawls, the first principle takes precedence over the second principle. That is, civil liberties are more important than economic advantages. That doesn't look like the United States right now, but hey. Um, the idea is, again, that this is what rational people would agree to behind the veil of ignorance. Of course, most people don't think about society behind the veil of ignorance, so this is, this is a thought experiment. But it's a thought experiment that tends to tell us what sort of society we should try to build or tr try to move uh, toward. And it turns out, in fact, that um, a lot of Western countries have, over the last um, century plus, have actually had broadly a history that it's bringing them closer and closer to these kinds of things at different rates for different countries. And of course, we're back and forth. Sometimes you lose ground, sometimes you regain ground. But if you think about the major advances in terms of civil liberties throughout the Western world in the past century or so, those are essentially along the lines of the two principles of justice that Rawls um, I outlined. Of course, people don't norm normally think of that uh, explicitly, but that seems to be the way in which people actually act. So those are uh, some ideas about the, the, two, the two questions of morality and, and justice. And let me close with another um, Monty Python song. Remember that some things in life are bad. They can really make you mad. Other things just make you swear and curse. When you're chewing on life's crystals, don't grumble. Give a whistle. And this will help things turn out for the best and always look on the bright side of life. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, the first the couple of weeks to sort of make, give them the very basic idea. And then it's, you know, the floodgates are open. They have an interest. They want to talk about these things. They argue with each other, which is exactly what you should do in a philosophy class. And um, respectfully, of course, on the basis of facts and reason, not on the basis of you know, name calling. Uh, but I think you're right. Largely, this is a matter of, of uh, missing a vocabulary and also it's you know missing concepts, you know, not the instruments, the basic tools of thinking about these things. Which is why I think that this sort of uh, basic understanding, scientific and philosophical understanding of reality, I think ought to be a major part of the curriculum of pre-college. You know, no, you don't want to wait until people get to college to, at this point. It's it's almost too late. Now that said, there is also, and I think that's what Brooks is concerned about. Uh, there is also a, a, a palpable, measurable tendency in modern American society uh, toward cultural relativism. And from the, the the step from cultural relativism to moral relativism is pretty pretty short. You know, once you you buy into the idea that you cannot criticize, it's not cool to criticize other cultures, no matter what. Uh, then you infer that, therefore, nobody must be doing anything wrong, that morality is all a matter of you know, uh, cultural uh, in, uh, differences. And I, I resist that sort of conclusion. I think that, that um, genital mutilation of young girls is wrong, period. You know, I don't care who does it, and I don't care if they get offended when I tell them that. Um, now, why do I think that? Well, because I have a certain understanding of human nature from which my understanding of morality stems. You know, I'm, as I said, I, I buy into sort of the virtue ethics uh, idea, but, but in fact, even if you are a deontologist or utilitarian, you will come to the same conclusion. Uh, so I, I think that the, there are two problems there for that. One is young people don't have the concepts, the vocabulary to deal with these kinds of things. They're simply not exposed to these kinds of things, uh, and they should. The other one is the danger that, uh, that people are not going to make a distinction between the idea that, yes, you do need to respect other people's practices, but within limits. There are some things that are, in fact, wrong for human beings to engage with. And, and if you engage, if, if somebody, a member of your society engage in that sort of thing, you will call him a psychopath and you lock him up. And, uh, you, know, and you, can, you should do that with members of other societies. Just because they're members of other societies, that doesn't give them a license to do whatever the hell they want. Uh, you said through the uh, veil of ignorance, you end up with a justice system similar to Sweden or Norway. Broad. Uh, yeah. But those are very homogenous societies that have very strict immigration. How do we translate what we learn from those societies to something like the United States? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, now, first of all, they, in the last several years, they've actually been significantly less homogeneous and less strict than, than the, sort of they have historically been. So that, but, that, but the point is well taken. Uh, that is the classical objection to, to a social democratic society. But, you know, the, there's two things. First of all, it's interesting that uh, Rawls actually starts out with the idea that we're talking about a multicultural society. In fact, the veil of ignorance works even better if you're in a multicultural society. Because if you're not, then you can, if, if the society is all made of Christians, there's no reason to, to uh, agree on a separation of church and state. You know, we're, it's, well, you're not, you know that you're going to be very likely in the majority, so who cares? Um, the idea is that the veil of ignorance actually works, or it's more rational, uh, precisely for multicultural societies because you don't know which way you're going you're gonna to end up. Now, it's also true that other Western societies are not that dissimilar. I mean, there's a lot of variation, of course, and, and I shouldn't include only Western society. There are some other non-Western societies that fall into similar um, arrangements, Japan being the obvious example. Uh, so the idea is that, for, for instance, in continental Europe, where there is quite a bit more uh, uh, pressure from immigration, there's quite a bit more multiculturalism uh, and has been there for some time. Italy, for instance, is more recent, but France has been that way for a long time. Uh, they also are essentially social democratic societies. They're certainly more social democratic than the United States is. And uh, you know, to point to the United States uh, as some people, some critics of, uh, you know, the major critic of um, Rawls is uh, Robert Nozick, who is the major libertarian philosopher, was the major libertarian philosopher. So not, not surprisingly, perhaps, right? So we're talking about the major clash here is between a social democratic view of society and a libertarian view of society. And Nozick's uh, reaction was precisely along those lines. You know, that it just doesn't make any sense. And the United States shows that you, you need to build a society along more libertarian um, lines. Um, 
empirically, it seems to me, however, that there is a lot of indicators that American society is just not working quite as well as the social libertarian society. So I think that Nozick is wrong, not only as a matter of principle, but it's also wrong as a matter of, of, sort of practice. Uh, the United States is the society with the highest uh, you know, largest gap between the, the, the rich and the poor. It's the one where the economic, uh, it, it's, um, while the economic indicators are very good compared to almost any other nation in the world, the social uh, index, uh, the social indicators are pretty bad by standards of uh, uh, Western societies. They tend, we tend to rank toward the bottom uh, of, that, of that list. So, you know, I think there's plenty of room for improvement, and that room goes into the, I think, does go into the, um, social democratic uh, direction rather than the libertarian direction. In your presentation, you discussed how humans have the ability to make decisions based on logic in the cortex and also based on emotion in the amygdala. Um, the amygdala is, or the cortex, is the newer portion of the brain from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, is there any evidence in science today or in neurobiology or whatever that grades the relative use of those two ways of thinking? Uh, is one way of thinking better than the other in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, actually the, the, the evidence goes the other way around. The, the evidence um, in neurobiology, for instance, if you pick up any of the books written by, um, by Antonio Damasio, who is a leading neurobiologist, he's written three or four books about uh, human brain and consciousness and so on and so forth. Uh, the one that I actually highly recommend is, uh, recommend is the, um, the feeling of what happens. Um, which came out a few years ago. Anyway, uh, the manager's idea uh, is that neurobiology shows what, interestingly, David Hume, the philosopher, uh, sort of intuited a couple of 250 years ago, which is that for a, a balanced human being to work, you really need both. That the idea that we need to suppress emotions and, and have reason lead the way, which was the Platonic idea. That's what Plato uh, thought. Uh, it's really fundamentally wrong because that's the way to psychopath uh, behavior. Okay, uh, the way you famously put it, a little bit provocatively, was that reason is and ought to be the slave of passions. And by which he meant that if you don't care about something, if you don't have an emotional attachment about something, reason isn't going to give you any particular uh, motivation to do one thing or the other. You have to care. And so the emotion has to be there and has to be a relevant component. Of course, we all know that if the emotion is the dominant component, if you don't actually think things through, then you're likely to make bad decisions. And, you know, the opposite of a psychopath is a, a compulsive, compulsive gambler, for instance, or somebody who makes emotion and, you know, uh, decisions only on the basis of emotion. But so the idea is that a functional human being, because of the way new human nature works, is that you have to reach some kind of dynamic equilibrium between the emotional component and the rational component. And uh, in fact, interestingly, the way to do that, um, you know, if you, um, if you compare different types of uh, psychotherapy, uh, which are supposed to be helping people reach that kind of balance, the only one that demonstrably works from an empirical perspective is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and it's a family of therapies. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the modern implementation of Aristotle's idea, based on virtue ethics, that virtue is a matter of practice. That the more you think about things and you, want, and you practice behaviors that, are, that go in the, in the direction of being moral and you know, good person and so on and forth, the more you internalize those things. In other words, they become your emotional reaction. So your brain and your emotions interact. You, you think about what is the right thing to do, then you say, I really don't want to do it. But you do it. And you, the more you do it, the easier it becomes to do it because you internalize it emotionally and it becomes the right thing to do. Which philosophical principles would you choose to apply to resolve ethical dilemmas in which both choices have serious uh, damaging drawbacks? Um, well, the, the major, the, I think the, the, the basic idea is, again, the, the reflective equilibrium. So I don't know which particular uh, situations you, you have in mind, but it's pretty common in ethics uh, that the questions are not that quite as simple as the, the, the trolley dilemma, right? There are these much more complicated situations where there clearly are um, 
different priorities, different rights uh, that come into conflict or different uh, uh, you know, ethical priorities that come into conflict. That's the more typical situation. Now, if you want to have a very, very good idea, I think you've had an excellent idea of how moral philosophers go about doing that thing, uh, you can read Michael Sandel's book, Justice, or check his YouTube um, uh, lectures, which are available for free. The, uh, Sandel is a, a very popular uh, philosopher, which is not an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> uh, he's, he's at Harvard, and he put all these lectures. The, his, his, his course on justice is attended by you know, literally thousands of people, and uh, his, um, his book is sold very well worldwide. It is the best book for the general public that I can possibly recommend about uh, ethical thinking. And it shows you example by each chapter takes a complex issue from real life situations, you know, from the news. And it works you through and say, okay, so your first reaction might be this, but then what about that? And okay, your second reaction is going to be this, but what about this third thing? And you never get to, you know, you don't get to the end of the, of the, of the, of the chapter and says, and therefore the answer is this. The idea is that he, he walks you through the process of thinking about it, and then you have to make your mind up. You know, philosophers are not in the business to give you answers. They're, they're in the business to provide you with tools to think about the questions. Right? Uh, but that's an excellent example. I mean, if you're interested in that sort of thing, that is the thing to do. As I said, the shortcut is to watch the lectures on YouTube. Uh, the better experience, I think, is to actually read the book. It's highly readable. Uh, it's called Justice um, by Michael Sundell. When you spoke of reflective equilibrium, you talked about the cognitive dissidence and that something has to change. Mm -hmm. And yesterday you spoke of something similar in, in the context of critical thinking. However, uh, using conspiracy theory as an example, <laughs> yeah. um, the level of cognitive dissidence may increase, but they may not, they just seem like they come up with another new twist Right. to the uh, theory. So therefore, in the, in the moral uh, or the justice uh, context, it seems like they may still not come up to the best moral uh, yeah. decision. Right. Now, that's a great question. Uh, the, 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 the issue there is, look, no system is going to be providing you with an ability to convince everybody. Right. I mean, the, what, the way one of my colleagues puts it is, I can explain it to you, I cannot understand it for you. You know, there's... <laughs> <laughs> it's a little nasty thing to say to undergraduate students, but it is right, right? I mean, it's, it's not, so sometimes, sometimes, and the idea actually does capture something important here. Uh, it captures the idea that actually there are things you can do as a teacher to explain things better, right? Sometimes it is, in fact, the teacher's fault in this, or in this case, the philosopher's fault for not explaining things, for not getting through the people, but up to a certain point. Uh, you know, up to a certain point is, you know, okay, I, I tried, this is what I did, and if you still disagree, fine. You know, that's, that's, there's nothing, there's no guarantee of being able to, uh, to um, convince people. Now, there's also interesting empirical evidence there, however, about cognitive dissonance. Uh, for instance, there is evidence that, that, not surprisingly, there is natural variation among human beings for the ability to, um, uh, to live with cognitive dissonance. And so skeptics, for instance, tend to have a much lower ability to deal with cognitive dissonance than people who are more gullible about things like astrology or UFOs or things like that. So there's some natural variation. So skeptics tend to be at one end of the spectrum. They really prefer, these are individuals who really prefer as, as coherent a worldview as possible. And on, at the other end of the spectrum, there's people who just can live with all sorts of contradictions and have no problem with it, um, right? And, and in the middle, there's most of us. You also have to remember that, so it's, the conspiracy theories may be at one end of the spectrum and there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, the other thing you can, although there are drugs, <laughs> there are drugs that actually can make both skeptics more gullible and gullible people more skeptics, skeptical. So there you go. Of course, I don't think we want to go down that route, um, but um, you know, it's all a matter of, a matter of chemi uh, chemicals in the brain. Uh, the other thing uh, uh, sort of to think about is that I don't want to give you the impression that it's only about coherence in the sort of logical sense of the word because, uh, you know, a conspiracy theorist can come up with a very coherent answer to uh, whatever it is that he's thinking about, you know, what con whatever conspiracy he's thinking about. Um, but here the, the concept of coherence 
in philosophy includes the empirical world. It includes science. So the idea is that you want to be coherent, not just in the sense of coming up with an explanation or a story or just so uh, scenario where everything makes sense to you. It also has to be coherent with the reality, with the outside reality, the way it is. And that's where the conspiracy theorists get run into trouble, uh, right? Because uh, you have to do increasing um, degrees of mental gymnastics in order to accommodate reality uh, in that in that direction. But again, there is certainly no guarantee uh, that just because you explain things in a rational way. I mean, you know, one of the, I, I just put, um, I just finished a series of seven posts on my blog about ethics, and one of which was about roles. And, and you know, there's this guy who's been commenting, you know, he's putting dozens of comments there back and forth with, with me and, uh, and say, well, but, you know, people are not rational. I said, okay, but this is about rational decision making. If you're telling me that you know you're a com- compulsive gambler and therefore even without w- behind the the veil of ignorance you're going to just take your chances, sure you can do that. But I can tell you that it is a non-rational behavior. So if you're telling me that you're fine with irrational behavior, okay, I cannot convince you otherwise. But if you if you want to stay within reason, then clearly that's the wrong bet to do. And you have to agree that that's the wrong, the, the wrong way to bet about, about things. If you still want to go ahead and do it, after all, it's, it's your choice. Uh, and this will be our last question. That really empowers me. Uh, a question. As we add technology between ourselves and the action, so emails, you know, it's, it's that electronic communication or pressing a button on a Predator missile or pushing a button to electrocute, you know, to electrocute somebody, and we separate the human from the act. Mm-hmm. Are, are, we, are we losing part of that, that, that philosophy and, and that, that emotionality? How do we put it back in? I mean, I know everybody in this room has probably gotten in trouble with email. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, uh, that's also a very good question. Um, one of my collaborators on the blog, um, uh, Michael Dedora, uh, recently published an entry, for instance, on the ethics of drone warfare. You know, of, of the idea that somebody can kill people at a distance and then go home to his suburban house in the evening and have dinner with their family. And, you know, what are the implications of that sort of thing? And you're absolutely right. There, there is a, I mean, I, I said earlier that the basic idea that comes out both from philosophy and from neurobiology is that a functional human being has to have a balance between the emotional component and the uh, rational component. If you detach yourself through technology from direct involvement uh, with other people, then you're clearly shutting down the emotional component and you're emphasizing the the rational one. So, yeah, I think that is, in fact, a problem. Uh, Now, you know, modern technology, just like any other technology, it's not intrinsically good or bad. It's how you use it. Uh, You know, uh, social networking is a great thing if it's used to keep in touch with actual friends that you... Uh, that live in a different city and don't, you know, have a, a chance of seeing or, or li- uh, hearing from regularly, it's essentially a useless waste of time if you have 2,000 friends who you never met and then never, you never talk to them. Uh, so it's, it's up to us. I mean, the technology in, increases the responsibility that human beings have to make choices. And therefore, it makes it even more relevant that we listen to evidence-based reality into science, and we reflect on that evidence-based reality. We engage in philosophical thinking. Um, that's, that's the only answer I can give you. Now, you, again, you, know, you can say, but that's not a popular answer. I know. <laughs> that's why I'm talking to you as opposed to, say, I don't know, a church. Massimo, thank you so much.